Undertale's No Mercy run is by far the most hyped aspect of the game due to its memorable battle with Sans and creepypasta-esque ending. There have been many fan animations and fan games that iterate on its ideas. Sans has become the face of the fandom. Edgy Sans battles are by far the most prominent product in the fan game scene. Indeed, Sans and Megalovania have become so synonymous with Undertale that they were the representation of the game in Smash Ultimate. It's understandable why this and the eerie image of Kara have cemented themselves in the fandom. The Sans battle is intensely challenging, especially for first-time players, and after spending the other routes as a mysterious but overall comedic character, save for his rare serious moments, the chance to actually fight him is a draw. It's gotten to a point where people know about the Sans fight before even playing the game, thereby removing the surprise factor as well as overshadowing everything else the route has to offer, and I think this is emblematic of the very themes the No Mercy run tries to both communicate and deconstruct. I think that as time goes on, the smaller details in the route are lost in the shuffle. So in this video, I'd like to look back and reflect on what Undertale's No Mercy run was really trying to say. The first thing to understand about this route is that it's not one you simply walk into. The game doesn't tell you what you need to do, and if you simply proceed through killing everything in your path, you're more likely to stumble onto a neutral route with higher LV. No, the only way to begin this route is to actively pursue it. The Ruins doesn't even give you a kill counter, you just have to grind and grind and grind, getting stuck in a fairly tedious loop of mashing the attack button with no indication of when or if anything meaningful will change. If you remove the years of Phantom Osmosis and spoilers from the equation, the trigger to this route effectively relies on the assumption that something will change from grinding, when in most RPGs, that is not the case, other than increased stats. Sure, if you've done previous runs with kills, you'll know that Undertale handles its casualties very different from other games of its genre. Flowey and Undyne both react to killing even the most minor encounter, and the latter offers more specific speeches for mini-bosses or unique enemies like Shiren and Snowdrake. To that end, it's likely this route is designed for experienced Undertale players first. The kind of people who, after getting one or more endings, may stop and ask, but what would happen if I did keep killing? Is there an upper limit? How high can I get my LV at the start of the game? Though there's also the camp of seasoned RPG players who assume grinding is necessary and do so to get ahead of the curve. Undertale's meta-narrative does still work on that front, as the game thrives on deconstructing RPG staples from the use of violence to the ability to enter people's homes or pawn things off on shopkeepers. But some people will look at this game, assume that you need to get strong, and thus you need to fight and level grind for future challenges, thus they focus on the mechanics over the narrative, and in turn feed into the very aspects of gaming this route intends to dissect. In either case, nothing meaningful happens until you hit the required killing threshold, at which point you'll finally get your first taste of what this route has to offer. An empty battle screen. The tiny, but nobody came text, and the ominous music of the same name all set the tone. The music persists outside of battle, droning and droning on and on. What's brilliant about this is, but nobody came samples a fraction of Flowey's theme, slowed down so significantly that it's unrecognizable. fantastic way to allude to the fact that by doing this route, you're effectively following in Flowey's footsteps, but we'll touch on that more later. Napstabluk doesn't even dignify you with a battle if you've exhausted the counter. At first, Toriel's house seems unchanged, until you interact with the kitchen drawer and get the red text, Where are the knives? When you interact with the mirror, you get the text, It's me, name. If you had inputted your own name earlier rather than the canonical name for Kara, this is likely especially unsettling, and doubly so if you've played the other routes, where the text instead says, It's you! A single blow is all it takes to strike Toriel down, and she feels it. Her broken laughter as she realizes she was protecting everyone else from you really sells just how much of a villain you've already become. After all, there was no greater force pushing you down this path, no evil possessing you to take it, no matter how many fanworks like to take that approach. It's just you. Whether from curiosity, boredom, or hype, you chose the most difficult path from a gameplay perspective because you wanted to see it through. While not a point of no return, it is a teaser for what's to come. And unlike in other routes, Flowey recognizes you as his long-lost friend, and also sees himself in you. He agrees to work with you, which carries over into subsequent areas, where he's disabled puzzles to encourage and support the endless slaughter of monsters going forward. The moment you step out of the ruins, the route is truly underway. Unlike the Ruins, which kept its normal music until you exhausted the kill count, Snowden's music is already slower from the start, hinting that something is amiss. The interactions with Sans and Papyrus take on a different tone as well. Rather than repeating the same familiar shenanigans, Sans immediately picks up that Frisk isn't emoting much at all, 
He tries to play it off, urging them to go behind the lamp, but they don't. The game is already going off script, almost as if it isn't supposed to be this way. The way Sansa's theme fades out really adds to the tension and hammers in how wrong this is. In a way, this can reflect how you, the player, have potentially already seen it all and just want to get to the point. The most unsettling part of the start of Snowden is how Sans basically says to keep pretending to be a human, suggesting that by this point you've already become something far worse where the in-game narrative is concerned, and this will be followed up later. Snowden is also where the kill countdown begins, as you've come far enough that it's clear that this is your objective. From a game design standpoint, this does two things. First, it demonstrates a clear change in the game and further lends itself to that uncanny off-script feeling. But two, it gives you direction where you were previously lacking it. If this is how you want to play, fine, but the game will still throw deterrence your way to test your dedication to following through. Snowdrake is just one of the hurdles, and he teaches you the importance of killing unique enemies if you wish to complete the route. Failure to do so will warrant the text THAT COMEDIAN on save points if you failed to take him out, as well as declaring the failure state if you failed to complete the task before exhausting the kill counter. It is worth noting, however, that Jerry is not a mandatory kill, nor is it a unique enemy. At high LV, you can spare it and move on, which is generous design given how difficult Jerry is to take out. As an aside, I really want to appreciate how the skeleton dialogue is still really funny despite the eerie tone of the route overall. You get gems like Papyrus talking about how he wants to look his Sunday best or his Tuesday good, and styling his hair, as well as Papyrus actually noticing the rock before the human, and Sans once again pointing out the lack of response. Papyrus starts to lose his temper throughout the puzzles, from getting annoyed when you walk through the maze when it's a loving tradition to suffer through puzzles, to meta comments about how he's supposed to explain the puzzles, then threaten with dangerous jakes, and my favorite bit where he says, okay, this is normally the part where you either agree or disagree, and depending on your answer, we say something great in response. Just seeing Papyrus lose his patience is equal parts comedic and sad if you've seen him in the other routes, so passionate and excited to share his puzzles with a human. Through it all, Sans encourages you to try the puzzles and have fun, and start contrast to the kill count taking down further and further. On a much more unsettling note, the snowman interaction is one of the most chilling in the route. Where in more passive runs, you can take the snow piece as a gesture of kindness. Here you're given the option to take and take until there's nothing left, which is a lovely encapsulation of the No Mercy route as a whole. The gauntlet of deadly terror brings more of Papyrus' irritation. At this point, he knows you'll skip the puzzle, so he doesn't even bother. Undone would probably appreciate it more anyway, because while she hates puzzles, she loves japes. This gives us a tiny nugget of extra characterization, which while nothing groundbreaking, highlights the wacky friendship that Papyrus and Undyne share before his final moments. Perhaps the most memorable part of this whole section is when Sans talks about the upcoming Papyrus fight, and how if you keep going down this path, you're going to have a bad time, an infamous line that has great payoff later. If you've successfully completed the route, you're treated to some genuinely unsettling atmosphere, like something out of a creepypasta. The shop is empty, and you get nothing but but nobody came as greeting text. You can steal items and monies and read a note where the shopkeeper pleads not to hurt her family. This really sets the tone that you are a mass murderer in a lived-in world, and these random encounters aren't just faceless EXP, but people with hopes, dreams, and families. The entire town's utterly vacant, save for Monster Kid, who somehow missed the memo. The little girl in the inn is just a decoy. Monster Kid just blames everything on adults acting weird. And then there's Papyrus. I feel like a lot of people focus on Papyrus' belief here, and not the dialogue surrounding it. They totally ignore his glorious roast, calling you a frickin' weirdo, berating your lack of interest in puzzles, and taking note of the dust and the dangerous path you've taken. But despite all of this, he offers his unwavering belief. He extends the hand of friendship, even when he knows he could die. In fact, if you spare him here, he admits that he actually was incredibly scared. And if you inspect the box of bones during his date after the fact, I'll mention how lucky you are that he didn't use his special attack, which would have surely blasted you. Many players do feel their conscience kick in here and report the run due to Papyrus' warmth and kindness, but those who proceed will find that he goes down instantly, and he's taken aback by how swiftly he's defeated. Even so, with his dying breaths, he continues to express his belief that you can change. It's heartbreaking and made worse by his check text calling him forgettable, showing how little he matters if all you're doing is killing to see what happens. What's also interesting is that Papyrus is a turning point in the neutral run, since not only does his death remove Sans from all of his funny scenes, remove his theme from Grilby's in the Snail Farm, and give Undyne a much more somber pre-battle speech, but it is also the only time his neutral judgments show a more genuine anger at your decisions. It's also by befriending Papyrus that you're able to befriend Undyne, and in turn befriend Alfie's in pacifist runs to unlock the game's best ending. This in turn further highlights the significance of Papyrus across all routes and makes his role in the No Mercy run more poignant. If the Ruins was a test of patience and seeing if you can incite a story change through violence, 
Snowden serves the purpose of testing the player's emotional detachment by lampshading it through character interactions, culminating in Papyrus's final appeal to your empathy. As Sans states in his neutral judgments, to increase EXP and LV is to distance oneself, and in doing so, it becomes easier to hurt and kill, and Papyrus is the encapsulation of this lesson. With his death, you're likely fully committed to experiencing this route, either as a means to an end by getting new interactions, or to simply progress most efficiently by focusing on the RPG mechanics. Thus far, bosses have been near formalities at best, with no genuine challenges to speak of aside from appeals to your emotions and the tedious grind. You may think everything from this point will be a breeze, and most of Waterfall will cement this mindset, but don't lower your guard, or you'll regret it. Waterfall starts off mostly unassuming, as it's already a fairly somber point of the game. Setting aside the slower music and the strangely silent echo flowers, Monster Kid remains ditzy and unaware, carrying on with their usual shtick. But this is very much by design. You're tasked to kill 18 monsters, higher than Stonin, but lower than the ruins. Nothing you can't handle, the enemies fall easily enough. Onion Son is gone, leaving just an empty path. Shiren goes down without a fight. Otherwise, nothing really changes until you encounter the Mad Dummy, whose rage is strong enough that she fuses with the dummy body and becomes the Glad Dummy. This is presented as a moment of joy, as she is fused with a corporeal form after a strong burst of emotions. However, if you consider the materials released after the original game, this becomes quite sad. In the Switch and Xbox versions of the game, the Mad Dummy has found a body she's even happier with, Mad Mew Mew, a form that she describes as being so fitting that as soon as she saw it, she knew it was her. And if you consider the newsletter, as well as the canonical post-pacifist alarm clock dialogue that applies to all versions of the game, then her ultimate fate is to become Mad Mew Mew and live a happy life. So not only is the ghost fused with a body that, while serviceable, isn't the ideal form, just as soon as you help this ghost become corporeal, there's no desire to battle. To continue this route, you strike the glad dummy down anyway, as if it's inconsequential. Just another obstacle slain in one shot. At this point, it might even feel dull. And then you get to Gerson's shop. I did a more in-depth video on the character, and how his interactions in the route are especially so cool. One thing I love about Gerson in this route is that he talks shit and can back it up, because you really can't hurt him in the shop interface and threatening him won't do any good. You're just wasting your time, which was precisely his goal, to buy monsters a chance to escape. Temmie Village is completely vacant, meanwhile, save for the shop. In a way, the shopkeeper Tam not realizing what's amiss arguably makes matters even worse. At the bridge, Monster Kid finally wises up, freaking out as they realize what's really going on. But despite everything, they want to emulate their hero. Despite everything, they take a stand. Everything about this fight is chilling, from the song In My Way, which is a slowed-down version of Anticipation, to the description of them simply being looks like free EXP. If you spare them here, you're back on the neutral route and we'll get the sad version of Undyne's speech from if Papyrus is dead. Everything resumes normally. If you try to kill them, Undyne takes the killing blow, and you get what is one of the coolest moments in the entire game, yet one that is tragically overshadowed by a certain skeleton. Undyne's sheer determination to save not only monster kind, but the entire world allows her to transform into the powerful Undyne the Undying, whereas in the neutral runs, you get a much more somber version of her final stand. This is the turning point for this route as a story. The last time you're asked to engage with Undertale's world characters and emotions before the meta fully kicks in. Undyne, who in other routes is so focused on justice without considering what comes next, takes a stand because she realizes there's something much bigger than the barrier, the souls, and her people. In this moment, Undyne transforms into a hero, who in any other game would be the protagonist taking on a heroic last stand to stop the ultimate evil from destroying everything. Her battle theme, Battle Against a True Hero, further cements this fact. But you aren't playing as Undyne. You aren't the hero. You're the villain, continuing to kill long past the point where there was any meaningful fun to be had, and so the game throws its hardest challenge yet at you. Where Sans is a fight you can eventually learn and memorize the patterns for, there's a certain element of randomness to Undying that makes her a different beast, even if a certain level of predictability occurs as you keep trying. There are no heroic monologues. There's no chance to abort the route during this fight. By landing that attack on Monster Kid, you are locked in for one hell of a fight, and in many respects, Undying is another test of your patience and resolve by asking if you are truly more determined than her, determined enough to keep trying, suffering defeat after defeat just to see it through to the end. In Undertale, determination is the power that controls the save file. It is a word repeated again and again at save points in all routes, but on this route, it goes from quirky and charming statements on being filled with determination to a cold, blunt determination. And it's by being more determined than Undyne that you're able to stop her, because for as determined as she is, you the player are more determined, assuming you don't give up here. What I find so interesting about Undyne's defeat here is how, despite everything, she's still smiling. She has an unwavering belief that you'll be brought to justice, that Alphys has already watched the fight and chosen to evacuate everyone, that in the end Asgore will use the six human souls. 
An empty promise, as we'll discuss later, but at this precise moment, Undertale's narrative dies. It dies with Undyne, that last shred of hope, because Hotland is by far the most empty experience yet. When I said the narrative dies with Undyne, that doesn't mean there's no story, but it does show a marked shift by severely scaling back the presence of story and scenes in favor of the bare battle mechanics in the grind. When you reach the lab, Metaton reveals that Alphys has already evacuated everyone, and while Metaton talks shit, he soon flees as the world needs stars more than corpses. And that's it. From this point on, there are no mandatory puzzles. You can continue straight through to the core and fight Metaton if you want, though in doing so you'll get the Queen Alphys ending and miss out on the last legs of this route. But considering you must kill 40 monsters to proceed, some might find it's more worthwhile to do it this way. At this point, while the kills are simple, 40 is twice the number you had to grind in the ruins, and more than twice the number for Snowden and Waterfall. It is this route's ultimate test of patience, save for its two very difficult boss fights. And the grind is really all that's left. Everything that made Hotland so memorable, from its Metaton TV shows to Alphys' absurd phone calls and texts to the little NPC interactions are all gone. Even the encounters with Muffet and the Royal Guards are so fleeting and bare bones they barely matter. The Guards do at least have a fun bit of flavor text if you check them, quoting the novel Kitchen, and if you choose to draw out Muffet's fight, you learn a lot about the situation in Hotland that you'd otherwise miss. I go into more detail about this in my designated Muffet video, linked above, but effectively Alphys left the path to Hotland open so that Muffet and the spiders could escape, but Muffet refused you due to her pride, which in turn allowed you to continue killing. But this is something you can only learn if you break from the pattern of the route. When you can instantly kill her and carry on your business, why bother? It's rather ironic in a route designed around the idea of going out of your way to break the game for new content that one of the only ways to get new dialogue from this character is to break the conventions from that route and actually let the fight play out in full, thereby adding to the time you must take in Hotland. It speaks to the level of care Toby put into this game. He didn't have to write an entirely new script for Muffet here. He could have had her simply not speak at all, but instead he tucked away interesting characterization for those who think outside the box and ask, what happens if I don't kill her yet? This in turn plays into the flower-like philosophy this route is built around, where it's less about killing and more about exhausting outcomes and bleeding the game dry. Otherwise, the only meaningful interactions before Metaton you get are the two shops. Braddy and Caddy have a letter where they reveal that they were evacuated with most of the other Hotland monsters, some last-minute humor of them trying to use up their gel pens and telling you not to steal their junk, and Burger Pants is an absolute king. His dialogue is so sassy and exasperated. In the middle of a massacre, he's still at work, even as people are dying all around him, and he's just as willing to talk shit about his boss and how inconsistent Metaton is with his hours and scheduling, and how he has an entire CD dissing Burger Pants. The best part of his interactions is that if you threaten him, he drops the amazing line, I can't go to hell. I'm all out of vacation days. It's a fun threat from a character standpoint amid an empty environment with little story left to grasp. Chances are, you still have a lot of encounters left by the time you reach the core, which means you're left with more tedious grinding. At least the music is good, even slowed down, which makes it a little more bearable, even if the enemies aren't as quick to kill. What I find so interesting is Metaton Neo. His pre-battle speech hypes him up as another difficult boss in the same tier as Undying the Undying, a secret alternate form that was designed as a human annihilator. The music is even a remix of the opening riff of Battle Against a True Hero, which when combined with the cool alternate design makes you think you're in for a treat. But if you fail to attack him and drag the battle out, you get nothing. You're stuck in a loop. The music doesn't escalate. It's also just a loop. You went through all that grinding, you put up with so much tedium, and you don't even get a cool boss fight for it? Metaton Neo goes down like a chump. If you met the requirements for the route, you don't even get a moving monologue. He just talks about his fan club and then explodes. However, if you fail the run, he actually gives a passionate speech about how, despite your best efforts, you aren't completely evil. You won't harm humanity. If you are trying to be pure evil, you failed. He's grateful that Alphys and humanity will survive in his dying moments. That's just so interesting to me, this disconnect between failing to meet the required kill count and succeeding. By failing, you get a more sentimental speech. By succeeding, it rings hollow. But perhaps that's the point. Because why bother with emotional gravitas when you probably just want to get to the point? Isn't it nice that he barely talks? That's less text to deal with. Get on with it, game! If the narrative was a rotting corpse before, with Metaton's death, it's fully cremated. By the time you reach New Home, there's nothing left of the original story and heart. Track 71 does not play, in favor of a slowed-down small shock. Instead of the monsters telling you their tragic tale, Flowey appears. This is where the true message of Undertale's No Mercy run shines through. At first, you get some missing context to Flowey's story that, while hinted at in the other routes, really puts things into perspective. He awakened as a flower, terrified and alone, and though Asgore came to comfort him, he felt no love for him. Though he tried to go to Toriel, she also failed to rekindle any lost love. Flowey felt empty, apathetic, 
utterly lost, to a point where he tried to follow in Kara's footsteps and take his own life. His fear of what would happen after death was the one thing that kept him alive, and it was also how he discovered his ability to save and load. And it is here where Flowey serves as a fantastic analog to you, the player. Andrew Cunningham touched upon this in his excellent video on Undertale's themes, but I think what really makes this hit home is how it transitions from hooking you with the missing pieces of Flowey's backstory to using that backstory to create a mirror. When we engage in video games for the first time, if it's a game we truly love, we get lost in the story, immersed in the world, and it becomes a genuinely emotional experience. We love the characters, or perhaps hate them, but the first time around, it's all new. It's all fresh, it might even be unpredictable. But with each passing playthrough, you know more and more. If a game has alternate routes, that can captivate you for a time, giving you new ways to engage with the gameplay, the story, the characters, and the world. Eventually, however, even that will grow familiar. Not necessarily unfun, but familiar enough that your engagement will typically change. Just like Flowey. He started off making friends and doing everything right, but eventually grew bored and decided to explore other options. He tried all manner of different outcomes and combinations, but eventually he knew the game so well that it lost the special meaning it might have had in life and in his initial runs. If you grind out his neutral dialogue, you can learn some supplementary information, like how Papyrus used to be his favorite and how he'd had a few run-ins with Sans that didn't end well. His monologue here adds more context to what led him to those outcomes and encounters, and that's just it. To truly grasp Flowey is to become Flowey. To get everything you need to know about him, you need to play through the game multiple times, try his tutorial in different ways, lose to Photoshop Flowey enough times to exhaust his game over dialogue, try killing and sparing him in different runs, repeat the neutral ending enough times to exhaust all his dialogue there. Eventually, he will wise up and start repeating, Don't you have anything better to do? The text in the house is so blunt. Nothing useful. No chocolate. I've read this already. The entries are always the same. You can infer some characterization about Kara, like how they made the drawing on the wall, how the family photo leaves them speechless, how they react to the Mr. Dad Guy sweater, and their confirmation of the date they arrived. The worn dagger and heart-shaped locket become the real knife and the locket, with appropriately unsettling flavor text. Physically, these items are the same objects, but the way you view them has changed, just as the way you engage with the game has changed. But it's Flowey beneath the spotlight. Flowey, who not only represents the way players may revisit games time and time again to try and recapture their initial joy, find something new, to get everything out of an experience, but also comments on how many people who don't have the drive to play this route will instead watch playthroughs. And this is very true. Many people are content to leave Undertale's pacifist ending in the good vibes, but still want to see what else is there. Even if you don't directly engage with the darker outcomes, or even if you simply back up and manipulate saves, Nagging curiosity often drives many fans to dig deeper, to ask questions. They need the full picture. They need to know what happens. In the end, though, it's still hollow. Flowey has grown tired of everything. Saving, killing, in the end, there's nothing left for him. Nothing left but some fragile hope for connection. That there's someone like him. Someone he can't predict. Someone he can relate to and live out his days on the surface with happily. In a way, this kind of reflects the way that people in fandoms seek community and common ground. Except Flowey soon realizes that that's not what he's going to get. Because just like him, you need to see it all. Seeing it all means destroying everything in your path. Bleeding the story dry, when faced with his own reflection, Flowey suddenly feels fear. Genuine fear. Even he starts to plead to stop, to go back, to give it all up. But you're so close to the end. So close to a gratifying finale that will make this slow, tedious slog of a grind finally worth it. You reach the last corridor. If this is like any other run, Sans will be there to cast judgment. What will he say, now that you've cleared everything in your path? What will you get? He promised you a bad time if you continue down this path. His pre-battle dialogue is full of poignant callbacks, asking if people can change, if even the worst person can be better. It's the same sentiment Papyrus echoed until he was mercilessly struck down. Papyrus didn't even put up a fight. Then there comes the, Do you want to have a bad time? A threat that if you proceed, he will finally truly take action. His pre-battle speech interestingly echoes Asgore in the neutral run. Then he strikes suddenly and relentlessly. Unless you know what's coming, you're likely to be blindsided and lose on that first attack. This is an effective way of demonstrating what you've gotten yourself into. You wanted something new, something epic, a true challenge worthy of your time. What you get is exactly that, as the Sans fight for beginners is brutal and unyielding, forcing you to learn the patterns and memorize them to even stand a chance to survive. Toby's signature song, Megalovania, truly captures that feeling that this is the end. Sans even lampshapes how his battle deviates from the norm, with him attacking first and refusing to stand still and take hits. 
His battle monologue sheds light on his awareness of the bigger picture, timelines starting, stopping, resetting. Though it began with Flowey and his myriad runs, it's just as possible that you contributed to this, if you're the sort of player who explored other runs prior. If this is your first run, perhaps not, and perhaps it really is Flowey where it all began, but it still ultimately has led to this moment where suddenly everything ends. But this puts into perspective Sansa's apathy in other runs, why he doesn't step in when his brother's in danger, why he doesn't even try to do any good. While it's true that he made a promise to Toriel, that can only explain so much when he's, by his own admission, given up on going back and that he doesn't really care about the surface. It's only when the fate of the world really and truly hangs in the balance that he is finally willing to throw down, because there's no one left to do it who truly understands. What a lot of the Sans fight hype loses is the fact that it's part of a much bigger narrative, both on an in-universe and meta level. The Sans fight only works as well as it does because it's earned, particularly if you did neutral and pacifist runs before but decided to go back and see what awaited at the end of the Dark Path. In neutral and pacifist, Sans never fights you. He's an overall friendly face who cracks jokes and sells hot dogs, with occasional threatening moments like the Metaton Resort scene and his various judgments. If you kill Papyrus, he disappears for most of the game. His judgment dialogue changes a lot on reloads, depending on your LV, and if you reload the game on a pacifist run into the corridor enough times, you get his passwords, his key, and learn about the lab in his basement, which reveals there's so much more to him than meets the eye. Then there's the fact that on neutral runs, he just asks you to look inside yourself and ask if you did the right thing. Only if you kill Papyrus does he grow truly judgmental, either calling you a dirty brother killer or demanding to know why you killed him. Subsequent reloads can net more unique reactions to your specific level of violence, which also feeds into the flowey-like mindset of trying everything and seeing what changes, and in turn makes the battle against him the culmination of the route's meta-themes. Hell, if you did keep redoing the neutral ending to get Flowey's dialogue, his warnings about Sans being dangerous finally see their payoff here. And yet, so many people will come to Undertale just for the cool Sans fight. Sans has been reduced to just this fight, and the No Mercy run has been reduced to just this fight, and the fandom on the whole is so obsessed with it that many, many fan games are just recreations of it that are harder, or maybe some kind of AU equivalent, or some other character in a similar position without the story and build-up to make those fights hit as hard in the first place. If you enjoy those kinds of fan projects, there's no shame in that. Fan creativity inspires people to learn how to make art, music, code, and that's something to be cherished. But I do think it speaks to a wider problem in the Undertale fandom and fandoms as a whole, where one element gets so hyped that it becomes divorced from its meaning and initial impact. What's meant to be our deconstruction of completionism and the way we as humans consume a narrative until there's nothing but bones left has become this epic power fantasy of beating the hard boss, so recreations try to be as obscenely hard as possible. And there's a significant lack of fan battles that explore neutral or pacifist related angles. Not that they don't exist. But they are a minority, and full-scale fan games are incredibly difficult to develop, so it's not even that I expect fans to meet the standards set by TS Underswap and Undertale Yellow. I just think there are interesting things to say about the Sans fight and where it stands as one piece of a greater puzzle. With all that being said, the moment where Sans delivers his mid-battle speech marks an interesting point. He tries to encourage you to turn over a new leaf, tries to encourage you to make friends. There's this reflective idea that perhaps you did act kindly in previous runs, that maybe things were different and maybe they could be different again. Exhausted players may decide to spare him because they've gotten their fill, or they just want to see what happens. It's a moment of genuine surprise for Sans, where even he points out how you've gone against everything you've tried to achieve on this run. He acknowledges the difficulty in making the choice, and says it won't go to waste, but at this point in the game, it's too late to turn back, at least by conventional means. And Sans gets the last laugh. He dunks on you, tells you to quit and never come back, because that's Sans' driving motivation here. He isn't trying to win, he's trying to be so irritating to fight that you lose the will to continue and either stop playing or start over and then give it a rest. And it's so interesting to see how his dialogue just keeps updating the more you lose, injecting dark humor before another bleak dance with death. If you get dunked on him and refight him, he concludes correctly that he got you, but you still came back, showing that you were never looking to be his friend in the first place. He mentions the other stanzas, assuming that in different timelines the friendship might have meant something. This also paints his get dunked on speech as a sincere plea to just give up, and that he does see it as a way out and a way for you to change by way of stopping. Unfortunately for Sans, each subsequent loss prepares you for the next. The more you fight Sans, the more you learn and adapt. Sans is limited by the fact that he's a video game character who can only make good guesses about your actions and intentions because he's so good at reading people. You, however, are a player on the other side of the screen, able to come back swinging, learning, and gaining momentum until you've lasted through even his longest and nastiest attacks. And all I can do is stand there and do nothing. Yet again, this is a culmination of the route's meta-nature. Just as Sans cheated by attacking first before, he now uses the constraints of the battle system to drag things out. He knows he can't win, 
so he'll make you sit there. The only problem is, he's tired. All it takes is for Sans to fall asleep, and you can break the rules of the battle system. You can cheat. You can move the box over to the button, attack him, and though he dodges the first strike, a second one hits automatically. At this point, you are unstoppable. You will win. You will reach the end. But before that, there are some poignant lines that speak to the nature of the run and what it's trying to say. How oh, there's no real benefit from continuing at this point. How you're doing this because you can, and because you can, you think you have to. Earlier in the fight, he wondered if maybe the anomaly just needed good friends and bad laughs, and above all else, happiness. However, if you've gone through the other routes before, then it's likely it's all been there, done that. Even Sans realizes this. He says you're the kind of person who will never be satisfied, but if there's an ending to experience, a new boss or hidden lore, then is it really so bad to reach out and take it? Some people get offended at how Undertale criticizes the act of playing and completing games. But I think the people who get offended by this need to stop and consider the type of game Undertale is. It is a game that treats the inhabitants of its world as more than obstacles to defeat, but characters who live in that world and explores the consequences of their deaths. In a game that asks you to consider options besides murder, like empathy and understanding, of course it's going to treat the act of killing as something more severe. Because this is a game that's supposed to make you think about tropes and trends that are treated as second nature in video games. It's a deconstruction. If it makes you uncomfortable, then it's doing its job. Sometimes the best works of media make us look at things we take for granted and question why it's so normal. But that doesn't mean Toby Fox hates video games, or that Toby Fox hates you. He grew up with many RPGs that he holds dear, that don't give the same attention to player action and consequence. Undertale simply wants to explore what it would be like if those aspects of games were actually acknowledged in-universe, and make players think about the tropes and trends that we typically don't consider by drawing explicit attention to them. So when Sans dies and you proceed down the empty hall, and when Asgore no longer recognizes you as a human, this isn't to say that Toby thinks you are a literal demon. Rather, it is emblematic of the kind of person you'd have to be to carry out these kinds of deeds in-universe. This even pays direct homage to the ending of the game off which is likely the source of inspiration for this route and its meta-message. Skip to the timestamp above if you want to avoid ending spoilers. But effectively, if you choose to abandon the mission to purify the world by killing and destroying everything, then you and the judge face off against the player character as the Bad Batter, now shown as a monstrous creature rather than the human-like avatar he appeared as before. Many times throughout this run in Undertale, characters like Flowey, Sans, and Undyne have questioned your lack of humanity, and now, at Lev 20, you are so powerful that you have ascended beyond the form of a mere human. You are the player. You exist outside the game and are not beholden to its rules. There is no enemy strong enough to satisfy you any longer. Because Undertale's meta-narrative is twofold. There's the angle of, this is happening in this world, and this is a game acknowledging you as an outsider, a player, someone with agency that no one in this game truly has. True, the game could have given you a triumphant final stand with the six-old Asgore, as was teased and foretold earlier in the game, but I think there's something so hollow about walking in, expecting something big, that Asgore can't even recognize you as a dangerous human and all, and falls before he can truly understand what's happening. It plays into a similar dissatisfaction with Metaton Neo, who faces a similar hype without payoff. You can argue it's unsatisfying from a game design standpoint, and even an in-universe story standpoint, but from a meta-narrative standpoint, it makes perfect sense. You're riding high after Sans, believing there's still an even greater challenge to overcome. But nope. Nothing. You kill Asgore. You slice Flowey into nothing as he begs for you to let him live. Flowey, who up until this point was so confident, so ready to treat you as an equal. But in the end, he is still fictional, just pixels on a screen. And now, he's in your way. And then you see the image of the fallen human, the human you name at the start of the game. There's a lot to be said about Kara's morality as an in-universe character, and how literally the version of them here should be taken. While well, I do think that with your guidance part of their speech is pivotal, and that the actions you take on this route do ultimately lead them to their final conclusions, for the sake of this video, I think it's more pertinent to look at the Kara who appears here not as the literal fallen human who died all that time ago, but a symbol. This is doubly important as you are asked to name the fallen human at the start of the game. Many classic RPGs ask you to name the protagonist or even party members. Even in games that give them more defined personality, such as Final Fantasy VII, you have the ability to insert any name you desired. So if we look at Kara here as an encapsulation of RPGs at their most surface level, then everything starts to click. The further you progress into this run, by focusing on grinding and growing stronger, the more the game's humor and heart fades away. The puzzles are already solved. Major characters die before they can leave a strong impression, with the sole exceptions of Undyne, Sands, and Flowey. And rather than the fun puzzle aspects of having to solve how to spare enemies, you just mash C until they die and the numbers go up. 
Just as in most turn-based RPGs of old, you'd simply mash the attacks to get stronger faster, and it's so easy to stop. The game gives you many ways out, to go back to the fun and quirkiness and breathe some life back into the game. To get to this final screen, you must forego all of that. You must play the game straight when it's not meant to be a straight-up RPG. And so Kara in this context is a feeling you get from regressing through a game. Everything from HP, attack, LV, and even gold count. So one could argue that even in more merciful runs, that feeling of growth and progress, the feeling of Kara, is there. And indeed, their memories as an in-universe character appear in places like Toriel's house if you sleep, the game over screens, and the waterfall flashback. But by now, even the narrative's ashes have blown away. All that's left is a black screen and eerie ambience. If this is your final run, then you have most likely seen the broad strokes of what Undertale has to offer. Isn't it time you moved on to new and better things? This is your last chance to close the game without any consequences. If you close the window now without choosing Erase or Do Not, then you're free to reset and play the game for a happier ending. It does require you to force quit, but you still have the choice. And it's not like you have anything to gain at this point, save for dialogue and seeing what happens. But no matter what you choose otherwise, the end result is the same. You never truly had any control. You were driven solely by that urge. The desire to see it all consumed you. And so the game closes. Files are created internally as a reminder of what you did, and you must wait ten minutes with only the sound of the wind to decide whether to sell your soul or remain in solitude. It's the perfect time to reflect. But you are the one who destroyed the world and pushed everything to its edge. And unlike other video games with bad endings, this is a video game that holds you, the player, accountable. And really, who cares about things like story or empathy when you can play through games and feel the rush of growing stronger? As my friend Xanamwa pointed out, Flowey is an exploration of completionism and what it would feel like within a game's world if the power to replay was an in-universe ability, while Kara at the end of the route represents the side of gaming where you focus solely on mechanics and progress. You taught them that these are all that matters, so go on and move on to new worlds, new games, and continue to do the same. Even if you can delete the flags, it's so fascinating how the game lulls you into the assumption that everything is okay until the very end of Pacifist. In a way, it might even drive some players to keep playing to see if there are even subtle changes to hint that something is amiss. Personally, I interpret both endings to Solus less as Kara is going to kill everyone on the surface now, and more, getting this happy ending doesn't erase what you did before. Even if everyone else forgets, the game still remembers. Kara still remembers. Regardless, it's a simple yet effective way to really hammer in the deconstructive idea of accountability from in-game actions, as well as the drive to see everything new that you can find. If you repeat the No Mercy run, Kara even suggests that your return to the game is due to a perverted sentimentality, and if you must keep playing after destroying the world, to try something else. After all, isn't this what you came here for? To see if anything changed? To feel that endless cycle of replays and ensure every stone is unturned. Until there's nothing but a hollow realization that there's no grand reward waiting at the end. I think the No Mercy run is a contentious one for many reasons. Some hate the grinding and find it boring and bad game design. Some despise how Metaton and Asgore are hyped up as big battles, only to be utter jokes in the end. And indeed, if the route was meant to be a fun and enjoyable gameplay experience, then I'd say it falls short, but as a meta-narrative about the ways we connect with video games, and the ways we try to stay with works that mean a lot to us, and find every secret and new line of text along the way, it works incredibly well. It's just that not everyone goes to games to be held accountable, and not everyone wants to slog through tedium just to get to two cool boss fights, even if, ironically, the Sans Fight's narrative purpose as a final deterrent instead drives many people to seek it out. You can look at Undertale Yellow as an interesting response to the original run, as it includes more difficult boss fights, a more uplifting ending for its human protagonist, and is less of a meta-narrative and more of a narrative. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Undertale's route was special for all its quirks and flaws, and to try and replicate it beat for beat wouldn't work nearly as well the second time. I think that's also why Toby took a different direction in Deltarune, exploring a whole other side of the meta-narrative through the way we as players co-opted Chris's life, and the way we have to push them into hurting and manipulating Noelle to get an alternative route no one was convinced existed at first due to the seeming linearity of the game. And while I do think the weird route works better as a marriage of gameplay and meta, I don't think its predecessor was wrong. Everything from the frustration and tedium to the disappointment was by design, and at the end of it all, it got me, someone who wasn't even really a fan of the route, or how obsessed the fandom is with it, to make an almost 20-page script, because it turns out that even I had more to say than I thought. If you like this video and want to see more like it, consider subscribing and ringing that little bell, because the algorithm hates creators and tends to not tell everyone when I post a new video. I do cover topics outside of Undertale, even if YouTube hates that fact, so if you want to check out some of my other media and character analysis, I'll provide some links in the end card and description. 
Because the algorithm is unpredictable and my income is always in flux, Patreon is a great way to show direct support and gain cool perks in exchange, like being able to see early work in progresses of scripts, videos, my written works, concept art, music, and more. With all that said, thank you so much for sticking through to the end. Have a fantastic day.